So I'd like to start our conversation today by playing a little bit of what we aired yesterday during CNBC's At Work Summit. It was a chat between my colleague Kayla Tausche and the Labor Secretary Marty Walsh in which he said that public opinion of unions is shifting. Take a listen. All this interest in unionization right now in the country that we're seeing, uh, you know, polling, I think it's like 65, 70 percent of Americans are looking favorably upon unions as in the past for the highest in 50 years. I don't think you'll see the benefit of that organizing until probably 2023, 2024. So, President Schuler, a lot of momentum right now, but maybe it will take some time to come to fruition. What do you think your runway is? Well, thank you for having me on the show, Elon. I, I just want to say Secretary Walsh is um, a card-carrying union member, and so we appreciate the work that he's doing over at the Department of Labor and waking up every morning thinking about working people. Um, but what he says is true in some ways because when you organize a union, workers come together, talk to each other. Uh, employers have the ability to voluntarily recognize them off the spot, but that doesn't always happen, as we know. And then there's a contract negotiation process that goes on. So there is a bit of a runway there, but the uh, benefits build over time. And especially as you negotiate a contract, that next contract and so on and so on. So uh, we've been making those kinds of investments in the labor movement for decades. And uh, I would argue that the resurgence that you're seeing in worker voice and people wanting to form unions is because they see unions out there fighting for them. And so no matter what kind of runway we have for the benefits, um, it's an ongoing process. And I think now is the time because working people are finding their voice. Do you think union membership will ever reach the levels that it was uh, back in the 1970s, for example? Or how are you going to measure the success of your organization and mobilization efforts? Well, we have throughout history, uh, we've been organizing, workers have been coming together obviously for over a hundred years uh, into unions. And throughout history, we've seen ebbs and flows of unionization primarily because of the laws and how um, people can or cannot form unions depending on uh, you know, the law, the economy, how it's doing, um, the desire of, of working people and, and what their needs are in the workplace. All of those are factors in uh, how we see those numbers climb uh, or not. And right now, we are at, as Secretary Walsh, an incredible moment where it's actually 71% of the public supports unions. It's the highest in almost 60 years. And uh, it's a moment unlike any other. So I believe we will grow. We will see a continued uh, incline in unionization, primarily because of the way the workforce is changing and the workplace is changing. We know the future of work is now, and especially coming out of the pandemic, how work has been changing. People want a voice. They want a seat at the table to be able to uh, shape the workplace, and especially when it comes to the workplace of the future. You mentioned the law and the economy as key factors in sort of driving uh, the outlook on unionization and the membership for unions. So I want to drill down on, on, on both of those issues. Um, in terms of the law, of course, the midterms are just less than two weeks away now. Um, and there's a lot of debate over which party is going to control Congress. I'm not going to ask you to for your political prognostication here, but it does seem likely that we're going to have some level of divided government. So what are the priorities that uh, the AFL-CIO can pursue that you think could get support from both Republicans and Democrats? Well, issues like good wages, um, retirement security, health care benefits, predictable schedules, those are not issues that are Democrat or Republican. They're working people's issues. So regardless of what happens in terms of control of Congress, uh, you know, working people are going to make their voices heard, and that's what they're out doing. We're mobilizing and examining the issues, seeing which candidates support working people heading into these midterm elections. But certainly, we want to work with whatever politician is going to support working people and, and really approaching that through an issues-based lens. And right now, you know, working people are struggling. We're seeing it day in and day out. People are trying to put food on the table. They're trying to fill up their gas tanks. They're trying to make sure that they can have enough time with their families and not be working unsustainable hours. Um, and have more predictable schedules. 
And so those issues are what's really driving workers. And uh, no matter what district you represent in the country, in Congress, those working people are going to be in your ear. And so I think that working people are watching. They're motivated. They're fed up. They're fired up coming out of the pandemic, especially being treated as essential workers one day and then treated as expendable the next. And so uh, now is the time. And uh, these midterm elections will definitely be a referendum on how people are, are feeling they're being heard. The other issue you mentioned was the economy. And while Washington is focused, of course, on the midterms, Wall Street has been talking a lot about the potential for another recession. After the pandemic, what we heard from business leaders over and over again was how hard it was for them to find workers and the lengths they were having to go to to attract those employees um, and to make their businesses the place where people wanted to come and work. Um, are you concerned that if we are in an economic downturn and the unemployment rate starts to rise again, that workers lose some of that upper hand? Well, it's certainly been a moment in terms of the economy where everyone's looking for talent. And I've heard it from several of your guests on, on this program that everyone is looking for talented workers. And the way you find talent, the way you keep talent is by treating people well giving them a voice and shaping their workplace. And, um, you know, looking at sustainable models, we don't necessarily want to see these business models where you have this churn and burn kind of mentality. We want to look to sustainability and attracting a, a talented workforce uh, definitely depends on, you know, the kinds of wages you're providing, the, the type of healthcare benefits and, and job security. Um, but more than that, we're finding it's the intangibles, the workplace culture issues. Um, people are tired of toxic environments. They're tired of being treated poorly and not having a say in how their workplace is, is being shaped or changed. Uh, so I think that that will be evergreen, no matter how the economy is faring. Uh, but certainly when labor markets are tight, working people feel empowered. And that's what we're seeing is that people are finally saying, you know what, enough is enough. I don't have to just take it anymore. I can do better for myself. And so that's the other reason people are coming together in unions, because they know that their voice is more powerful when they come together collectively than if they're individually in the office um, or in a workplace. So I think that the future absolutely looks bright for more working people continuing to leverage their power and their voice and doing that through a union. You mentioned some of the intangibles that have become so important to workers, especially um, as we come out of the pandemic, like workplace culture. How do you negotiate for that? In other words, you're saying it's not just about the wages that people get paid anymore. There's a whole host of other things that are important to uh, the way that they work, not just how, what they get paid. How do you include that in a contract negotiation? And what are ways that workers are trying to uh, demand some of those intangible factors uh, play into their play into their workplace. Well, the beauty of a union is it is a democracy, and so the members get to decide what's most important to them in the workplace. And then to have a contract where you can actually sit at a table with your employer, um, talk about what matters, what's important, and work through that together, labor and management uh, negotiating together. Um, and against each other in some cases, right? Because often there's a tension there where working people, want more of a say in the workplace and want to be heard. Um, and sometimes employers don't like that. Um, but I think the issues are uh, certainly the tangibles, as we discussed, you know, the, the wages, hours, and benefits. But on the intangible side, I've seen so much creativity in using this tool we call collective bargaining, uh, where working people are talking about, um, you know, time off, um, talking about um, how the workplace is going to look if you're remote working, to be able to have a say in how that's set up, especially as there's more surveillance in the workplace. Um, I've even seen um, uh, workers come together to negotiate their company's carbon footprint or environmental protections, where they're seeing something happen on the front lines in a workplace and they know it could be done more efficiently or uh, more uh, eco-friendly. Uh, eco um, they're using their collective bargaining agreements to negotiate. So those are the kinds of things that we're seeing that this tool of 
Unions and collective bargaining has become modern and it's become more relevant than ever in the workplace. And certainly it's spread across uh, more industries maybe than it had historically uh, been in. I think a lot of business leaders, a lot of companies look at what's happening at Amazon, looked at what's happening at Starbucks, and they wonder what this means for their own relationship with their employees. What's your advice for business owners, for managers who say, how should I be potentially rethinking the way that I uh, interact with my workforce? Well, absolutely. And I would say to any business person listening that unions can be thought partners. They can actually be solutions driven and make your workforce more productive and then you more profitable. So the idea here is it's a partnership um, and that, you know, it knows no bounds. Like you were saying, working people in every sector of the economy are looking at this idea of coming together making their voices more powerful collectively through a union. And so whether it's video game developers or minor league baseball players who just joined the AFL-CIO, um, graduate researchers at the University of California, um, the workplace is the workplace no matter what kind of work you do. And it's working people coming together, having that conversation uh, that forms a union. And businesses don't need to be afraid of that. They can see it um, not in a stereotypical way that I think a lot of business people do from the you know models of the past that it has to be adversarial, that um, it's only for certain types of work. Absolutely not. The labor movement is a modern um, movement. Um, we are fighting for a more inclusive mm -hmm. workplace and want to uh, continue to be solutions driven. Yeah, you've you've actually pointed to Microsoft in the past as an example of a successful relationship. What about that worked? Well, I think Brad Smith uh, is a pioneer in so many ways, but he saw the trends. He saw working people in so many industries saying, you know what, this is this is something we want to see in our workplace. So he said, if this is what the people want, we should allow them to make that choice for themselves. And right now under the law, it really is written to allow working people to form unions. It just doesn't always happen so easily because of employer interference. Um, and employers break the law uh, with impunity, um, you know, obviously harassing and intimidating workers who often uh, who want to form a union. But uh, Microsoft decided, you know what, if this is what our workforce thinks is most effective for them to bring their voice to the table, then we're not going to stand in the way. So that's really all people want is a neutral position from companies to allow working people to make that choice themselves. Are there certain industries or other companies that you see as uh, ripe for that level of organizing? Well, as I said earlier, really every workplace can and should form a union. Across the primarily, board. Primarily, yeah, across the board, because it's really about that seat at the table. And so no matter what type of work you do, we've seen it in the professional sector where um, you know, people in the medical field, doctors are forming unions because of what they went through during the pandemic and not feeling safe to really raise the issues around safety and health without having the safety of, a, of their coworkers behind them uh, and their contract uh, giving them that voice. Um, we're seeing it, as I said, in, in um, the, tech, the tech industry. Um, Google just, um, workers just formed a union um, in the South of all places. And so it really knows no bounds right. and it really is just, a, you know, workers coming together, talking to each other and standing up for themselves. And, and you all have leaned into, the AFL-CIO has leaned into the use of technology um, to help workers come together and organize. Can you talk a little bit about some of the new tools you're using to, uh, to, to foster that type of community? Well, of course, um, using technology for organizing is absolutely what we're seeing, uh, but nothing ever replaces the good old fashioned face-to-face -face conversation as we know. And in fact, I think more of that needs to take place because we are in our tech kind of bubbles often and not talking to each other. But, you know, we're seeing tools like TikTok and Reddit and, um, you know, we have a tool called Action Builder um, that we use in, in terms of relationship mapping. Um, so we're actually seeing more technology used than ever before because it's a way for people to communicate without fear, um, without, you know, that kind mm -hmm. of 
uh, looking over your shoulder and um, you know, using the traditional methods. Uh, so we're absolutely modernizing the way we can communicate with workers and um, you know, workers talking to workers is what this is all about. And final quick question for you, President Schuler. We are all trying to create the new normal here as we come out of the pandemic. Everyone's wondering, you know, what's going to stick? What do we learn from the pandemic? What do you see sticking for workers? Well, coming out of the pandemic, I think people are seeing work like never before. We used to take it for granted. We used to go about our day and expect that things were just going to be there, that the working people that provided the grocery uh, stores being stocked. Um, you know, the folks who are driving public transportation and getting us to our jobs, we're just going to be there. Um, and I think that that was a, an awakening that people finally can appreciate and see the value of working people that really make this country move. Um, so that's my hope that uh, that's not just a temporary thing, that working people continue to rise up, find their power, uh, demand what they deserve and uh, make this uh, the most productive economy that, that we continue to see.